Hello. Can anyone hear me? Good, thank you.
Sorry, no, he's not sure. I'm I'm not supposed to come in till you. So you need something like this. Send this to you. Are you mad? I see this. I'm this and you show me. Please send this to me. Send it to me on WhatsApp. That will make the joint truth. Everyone. Um, I see Polanli, Grace, and um, Patrick um, Chukudike. Yes, check. I dropped it. Yeah, good afternoon. Yes. Yes, good afternoon now. It's a pleasure seeing you this afternoon. Pleasure seeing you as well. Um, I wanted to say that I didn't, I wasn't able to get um the the biography of some of the some of our presenters today, but I guess I was only able to get Bolanle. Graces. All right, um, please. I heard it. I think um, one of our panel members is trying to join, so I'm trying to assist. Did you get that? Sorry, I, <laughs> I didn't get that. Because yeah, one I mean, of our panel members, okay, one of our panel okay. members is trying to connect, so I'm trying to assist them. Just a moment. Okay, no, okay, no problem. Because it's it's raining today in Lagos, you know. I know we might have um, issues like this, so I guess we should be prepared for for people to be going and coming out. Okay. Um. But then we. I don't know. Maybe we we'll wait for just one more minute, for um for the duo of um, Shion Adjase and you know, Shakir Raji that are supposed to also present, um, after which we, we, I think we have to start because it's already past one. What do you say, Brandi? Should we go ahead and start? Or... Okay, we wait for them. We could spare a few minutes more. So oh, sorry for the delay. The rain here has been very heavy. So I think that's the reason why we're having network issues.
Have you been able to open it now? Oh, yeah, I'll try it now. Yeah, I'll, I'll okay, I'm good. Network. Okay, we are going to start now. And then the rest of, you know, if anyone joins us, um, yeah, welcome. Um, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is um, Ayodeji Adegbite. Um, I'm a PhD candidate um, at the University of Wisconsin Madison, um, you know, where I'm presently working on my uh, dissertation, uh, which is tentatively titled Decolonizing Global Health um, Environment, African Medical Practitioners, and uh, Politics and Science and Disease Control in Africa. Um, and my dissertation basically attempts to answer you know, two major questions, you know, which include um, how does diseases emerge, right? Um, you know, what are the historical circumstances that leads to, you know, the emergence of this disease? Because it seems like Africa is like synonymous to diseases, right? And so I'm, I'm really interested in, um, um, you know, the question of um, the economic um, you know, and political, you know, changes, you know, and ecological changes that led to, you know, uh, the emergence of this disease. And I'm trying to look at this through the you know lens of um, African doctors, you know, right? You know, and by virtue of that, um, I'm looking at the emergence of you know in inter in international health systems and, and global health. Um, and then, I mean, but obviously, you know, Africa indeed, you know, Nigeria's medical crisis is bigger than my projects, you know, and um, you know, um, yesterday, for example, we have um, um, the the deputy, um, you know, Senate President, UK Ikurimadu, right, who was charged with uh, conspiring to transport a boy to the UK to harvest organs, you know. I mean, I know this, the case has like, you know, a multifaceted, um, you know, aspects to it, right, that, but most comments on, on social media, you know, social media, right, pointed to, you know, some of the issues that medical historians, you know, uh, uh, have been, um, you know, saying all along, like, um, why can't our leaders, you know, actually build facilities that are capable of, you know, um, um, carrying out, you know, such, um, um, you know, procedures? And um, what are the kinds of, um, you know, circumstances that make uh, that made um, it possible for uh, Korimadu's daughter to, you know, to have the possibility of actually living while there are thousands, right, who suffer from, you know, you know diseases. Uh, in Africa, who could not, you know, afford that, right? And then, so that's like that's like the crux, right, of, of you know trying to understand, um, you know, the medical history, um, you know, of um, of Nigeria, and um, indeed, you know, um, the this panel is going to be addressing different iterations, like right, of um, you know, medical issues, right? Um, and historians, you know, basically, you know, we offer a perspective on. On different aspects of, of this, this um, of the past, you know, to understand how we are where we are today, as far as um, you know, um, the, uh, medical insecurity, you know, is concerned in Nigeria. And then, so we have four speakers for this for the part one of this panel, and each speakers have um, fifteen minutes to give their presentation, and then we'll have thirty minutes um, for the question and answer section, and then. Um, we have um, our first speaker is um, Belanli Grisa Ditula of the University of Ibadan, and she'll be, um, you know, um, talking about um, healthcare system and development discourse in Nigeria. Um, Ditula Belanli Grisa is a postgraduate student and a research assistant at the De uh, Department of Philosophy, University of Ibadan, University of Nigeria, and she researches on philosophy, African logic, and epistemology. Bioethics and um, African studies. Um, Bella Legris, you have the floor. Okay. Good afternoon, once again, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, you've read a brief um, about data of myself. So, this afternoon from Nigeria, I will be speaking on healthcare system and development discourse in Nigeria. I really did boil down my, my topic and this research to Nigeria, just be, um, so as to enable us actually achieve something 
basically that is contextual and can really be effective in whatever research we, we proceed on. So this paper has, actually has um, about three major aims. The first is to examine the Nigerian healthcare system, looking at the trajectories, histories. Then we are to ever. Then I would be able. I'll be carrying out an evaluation of its developmental status. Is it develop? Is it on a positive development? Is it underdeveloped? Is it overdeveloped? Which of course we know it's underdeveloped. And then we'll be. Uh, my people will be addressing ways out, more like a panacea to the challenges faced by the Nigerian healthcare system. But to start with, I would like to, to begin on, with, on a note that one inarguable permanent phenomenon of existence is change. Yet, only the fittest have selective advantages to exploit positively in a changed environment. I have started on this note of change because um, even the Nigerian healthcare system is not even the Nigerian healthcare system is not an exception when it comes to changes. Its major concerns from disease, researches, um, epidemiology, treatment, they have kept, they kept evolving over time and changes have been noted in all these things. So that means it is, it is practically impossible for us to discuss about um, Nigerian healthcare system without first talking about, okay, without first talking about change in itself. Um, another thing to note is even that the training of these public health practitioners themselves has over time received um, different modalities. It has changed over time. So also, considering this present circumstance, it is difficult to allude that these changes have actually meant progress, stagnation, or retrogression to the totality of Nigerian healthcare as the Nigerian healthcare system is what is purely is poorly developed. And that's the first challenge that my paper identified, the um, stagnation and retrogression um, stage of Nigerian healthcare system. The second challenge that uh, my paper identifies when, in, when discussing about healthcare, public healthcare system in Nigeria is the fact that um, looking at the history of Western medicine and its trajectory, one thing that would realize, oh sorry, about that. one thing that would realize is the is the competitive uh, method rather than the complementary intrusion that come with public health in Nigeria. Um, do I have the permission to switch off to turn off my camera because they've just they've just taken the light and everywhere seems dark. So you could actually respond through the chat box. I will see that there. Okay, let me. You can continue like this if you if you want. Um, at least you can still see. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. That was good. So, um, another challenge I want us to notice that's the second challenge I identified is the competitive hegemony that arises from the Western intrusion into our healthcare system in Nigeria, rather than the complementary uh complementary model that could accommodate our traditional herbal medicine, our traditional mode of, of healthcare system. Thirdly, another challenge I identify within my paper is the challenge of Nigerian healthcare system on a pedal of curative medicine rather than a preventive one. It is something that is very obvious, especially when, when we take a very good look at the recent COVID-19 incident. Public health system, public health care should not only be for cure, but rather it contains tracking, identifying, monitoring, and control of disease, rather than focusing only on the curative method. And if you remember the first challenge I identified has to do with the stagnation and underdevelopment of Nigeria public health system, even in the curative method, rather than the preventive, they have not still be able to effectively um, uh, effectively reach the tax. Looking at that COVID-19 incident I made mention of, you could see that by the time we had to, there, there was this high dependency 
on what other country has to offer us. Okay, thank you. On what what um these other countries has to offer us, rather than we ourselves, the public health care system of Nigeria seeking out solutions themselves. But as researchers, it is not just um it is not just a thing for us to identify these challenges, but to ask ourselves what are the way out, what contribution can we offer. In providing, um, in providing certain panacea that I noted in my in my research paper, I would like to make recourse to Albert Camus. Albert Camus is, is, is an existential philosopher, and it's his book on uh, the plague, 1947. You know, he says, and I quote, I'm paraphrasing this, he says, since the order of the world is ruled by death, may it not be better if we arise ourselves rather than look up in the sky to him where he sits in silence for solution. I would like to call uh, our attention to several um, issues that, that, we have to, uh, that, that we have to look out for critically in providing Penesia. The first one is to ask, the first thing that, that, um, that I would like us to notice is we ourselves getting solutions by ourselves. Nigeria has oftentimes been shaped with the, the idea of, oh, our leaders are bad, corruption is everywhere. But this is not something we can always make recourse to. Truly, the effect of politics, leadership, governmental policies in healthcare cannot be overemphasized. Especially when we look at the, the difference between rural healthcare system and even the urban healthcare system. The Nigeria healthcare system has suffered a whole lot of a lot of self, um, downfalls. Um, okay, I, I I made a list of some of these things I would like to mention here. First is the the country is greatly underserved in the healthcare sphere. Also, also there are challenges such as um, okay such as lack of coordination, fragmentation uh, fragmentation of services. There is a debt or there's a debt of resources, inadequate resources. So when you get to public health healthcare, um, healthcare institution in Nigeria, it is it is an obvious um, stat statistics that there would always be a lack of resource here, gas there, or even their um, um, their equipment. But yet we cannot just say uh, yet. The onus is not on us as researchers to simply say these problems are there, but it is the onus is on us as researchers to identify and think of ways to provide solutions. Another issue I identify within um, within this discourse is the issue of how political is colonial medicine. How political is colonial? Um, um, I, I, earlier I mentioned something about the sharp disparity between the medical resources in the rural setting and in the urban setting. But I would like to, um, to put this out as, as, um, as, as, a as a statement that this issue is not a recent one, but rather it has been from the, from the, from the foundation of colonial medicine. So um, in my paper, I made recourse to when colonial medicine came up from Abe Okuta in the 1860s. At first, the treatment began with the whites treating only the whites. Gradually, it extended to the whites treating those, um, treating those who does a similar job to them. That is those in the white collar job before it became open. Even those, even the medical um, resources from the missionaries shows, so, um, shows um, such disparity. Another fourth, uh, fourth issue I identify here is is the, it's actually a big question I noted down that can Nigeria healthcare embrace an holistic approach to the tax delivery? I mean the tax at hand. Now I have identified that oh there is a disparity, there is lack of equipment, some things have been caused by colonial. But we ourselves can we arise to to the tax of embracing an holistic approach? And when I mean embracing an holistic approach, um, I'm saying this. Nigeria is made up of, of over 250 linguistic groups. And all of these ethnic groups have something in common. That's traditional medicine. And it is important to note that part of African epistemic 
is Niger is is um, their medical pra uh, practices. That has no, that is not just a relegated one, but something that has evolved over times. Uh, within my during my last paper, when I was talking about indigenous knowledge, I have argued that medical knowledge, traditional medical knowledge, is not just uh, uh, a knowledge that can be relegated or discarded based on in in incompetency. No, these apps, these meds, these apps, their procedures, they have evolved over time. Um, I'll make recourse to sorry, a little you have, time. Sorry, okay. you have three minutes more. Three minutes more, okay. Okay, let me just, let me round off. Okay, so um, the last one, beyond what we can, uh, beyond can Nigerians embrace an holistic method? The last thing I identified is also a big question. What re of what relevance is Nigerian Medical Association developmental scheme, template and policy, considering the Nigerian healthcare situation today? The Nigerian Medical Association is, is, um, is a body that is assigned with different responsibilities. And one that I noted especially is to assist Nigerians in pro Nigeria in provision of smooth, efficient, and effective healthcare delivery system. We could now push a, a, a question forward. What role exactly are they playing in today's society? Beyond just um, accepting, oh, this is what has happened to us. This is, there's a death of result. What can we pinpoint that these people have been doing? In conclusion, like Albert Camus quote that I, that I made earlier, I would like to say, let us arise and fight by ourselves for ourselves. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, you know, Belanda Grace, for that um, you know, really holistic survey of, you know, um, the, you know, I think the entirety of the um, Nigeria um, um, healthcare apparatus, right, you know, and giving us insights you know, from history and also identifying, you know, some of the challenges and others, right, uh, <clears throat> that um, Nigeria faced, um, you know, faced in, in trying to achieve health for, for Nigerians. Um, and then, so we quickly move to um, Dokas Fagite, um, who is um, going to be um, talking to us about um, the about strengthening the nation international health initiatives in post-independent Nigeria. She's from Obafemi Awolowo University. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you can you hear me? All right. Good. So thank you, Ayodeji, for the introduction and for putting up this panel and then special thanks to LSA for giving us the platform to you know destroy our ideas so this is actually an idea I conceived in the course of the research for my PhD and like okay so this is like the first time I'm you know presenting it so it is actually open to more comments and then um, open to comments suggestions that would help strengthen strengthen the work and you know improve the quality of the work. So I would like to start by saying that most scholarship on the history of medicine, public health, and health policies in Nigeria, as they've been primarily focused on the colonial period, with only a few studies that have examined the historical legacies and um, continuities of health policies into the post-independence Nigeria. So the aim of this paper is actually to examine how constructed, how Nigeria const constructed um, its national health policies in the wake of the colonization. And then the paper also hopes to give a detailed account of our health initiatives of several international organizations, particularly the United Nations through the WHO, and UNICEF, among others, help, helped in strengthening Nigerians' healthcare system. So one important thing to note is that the newly independent ministries of health across the country were faced with um, numerous public health challenges that threatened to, to derail their efforts at effective governance. So international organizations actually supplied critical funding and of course, technical experts to help officials navigate um, questions of population control, nutrition, and then disease prevention. So in the, 
in the in the wake of in, um, independence, what was just organized organizational structure of the Nigerian healthcare system? The Nigerian healthcare system is actually was structured in three levels. You have the primary, the secondary, and then the tertiary levels. And with the three tiers of government, i.e., the local government, the state government, and the federal government sharing responsibility for provision of health services. So the local government is responsible for the primary level, while the state is responsible for the secondary level, and then the federal government responsible for the tertiary level. So the federal government is also um, responsible for the development of national health policy, as well as providing technical assistance to state ministries of the health and local government health authorities. So on the part of the state government, they are responsible for um, state tertiary and secondary care regulation, as well as um, providing technical assistance to local government health authorities. While the local government health authorities, they are primarily responsible for primary health care um, service delivery in Nigeria. So the health care system comprises of the public and then the private health, health sector. And then in the case of the Nigerian health care system is actually a complex kind of um, system with a mixed system with both private hospitals operating as um, free market entities. And then you have the public hospitals operating as government um, government entities. So the issue of healthcare system development in Nigeria dates back to um, the pre-colonial period and of course the colonial period. But the, the paper is actually focused on the post-colonial or the post-independence era in Nigeria. And over the past um, five decades, a number of developmental plans had been designed in Nigeria. You have the first national developmental plan in 19, in that, that was between 1962 and then 1968, in which there was no strong focus on the development of healthcare system during this period. Then the focus during this period was actually on building more of hospitals and of course, related infrastructure in different administrative areas. And then priority was actually given to curative care. And then government was, they were not at any point committed to preventive care at this point. So then you have, we also have the um, second national health care, second national development plan, which was between 1970 and 1975. And this developmental plan actually emphasized social change rather than giving um, even priority to public health agenda. So, and during this period also, government was not um, committed to preventive care with about 72% of the resources of health care, um, health care allocated to curative services, while only about 16 was allocated to um, preventive services. So according to this policy, the expansion of, the expansion of measures for um, maintenance of environmental sanitation, and then the institution of the, the institution um, of measures to control um, communicable diseases were important to achieve the stated objectives of this developmental plan. Then the third developmental plan was between 1975 and then 1980, which was actually influenced by the oil boom at that time. And then the development of national healthcare system started during this period. With, um, the, with the primary health care system as the cornerstone. So as a result of this, the National Health Implementation um, Plan for the system based on um, PHC, that's primary health care system approach. Then you we also have then the basic health service scheme. They were both developed with the assistance of the WHO at this time. So the basic health um, service scheme placed emphasis on curative service rather than preventive services, just like other developmental um, scheme. And then in, in, in order to ensure the effective implementation of the um, basic health service scheme, the, 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 the National Basic Health Service Scheme implementation, Implementing Agency was established by the federal government in 1976 with the hope that it will increase the coverage of 
health services from 25% to about 60% by 1980. But unfortunately, in this case, it, 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 it had to be abandoned to implementation because of implementation ch challenges. And then there were also some drawbacks, which were as a result of poor commitment on the part of the Federal Ministry of Health bureaucrats, poor budgetary allocation to the scheme, corruption, and then weak political will, and also poor capacity of local government. So this actually draw, set, um, this actually caused um, certain setbacks. Then also the fourth national developmental plan, which was between 1981 and 1985. So this was actually influenced, this develop, developmental plan was actually influenced by global initiatives and, and ideas. And then it was the first attempt really by at addressing health systems issues, issues that was devoid of political and economic bias. So the plan was based on a comprehensive primary health care, primary health care approach and focused on the whole system with the inclusion of community participation and then provision of promotional, protective, restorative and rehabilitative, rehabilitative service services to an increasing proportion of the population. So with WHO's intervention and capacity in Africa prior to the, the national independence, and this actually began with Ghana in 1957, and then the rapidly unfolding across the continent in subsequent years, in which about 17 countries became independent in 1960 alone. So it was extremely limited and then with the assistance of the WHO in the eradication of um, your, and then with the eradication of your, and then preventive measures put in place for smallpox epidemics. So it became the, 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 the interventions of the WHO through the intervention of the WHO and of course UNICEF became very important and it became very significant. So African countries were actually to benefit from the supplementation of existing international assistance programs with, of course, in quotes now, national plans and as approved by the World Health Assembly in 1962. So in the case of Africa, negotiations began with the United States government to provide extra funding that would be needed. And at first it was emphasized that 10 African countries would be the first subject of um, national health planning. And this was, ex ex this, um, this was linked to their recent achievements of um, independence with Nigeria inclusive. So, and I think at this point, it would be wrong to characterize WHO's um, approach as, a, as, as an imposition, as an imposition. Um, thank you. Sorry about that. So as an imposition of um, Western values and ideas onto um, post-colonial states in Africa. So from the onset, the, exec uh, the executive board was alert to, um, they were alerted to the importance of letting national, um, national governments articulate their own needs with the United Nations agencies advising on how to coordinate and balance those needs and furnishing experts advice to build um, administrative capacity. So in the case of Nigeria, it is important for us to actually look at, because part of the work is to look at um, the contributions, the role played by international organizations in providing um, through their health initiatives and in strengthening the um, healthcare system of Nigeria, the, of, of Nigeria. So, in the case of Nigeria, several international organizations, they played um, phenomenal roles in the development and maintenance of healthcare services. Unfortunately, most of these contributions, they actually passed through the government, mostly um, the federal government. And these are kept, which they, by, by, passing them, by passing these interventions through federal government, it's left us with um, um, a kind of disadvantage in, in which, a kind of disadvantage, i.e., they, 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 they kept little record 
of the impact of this contribution or the impact which um, these contributions have made. So the also records of the exact cash amounts that these um, organizations donated or contributed, they are, they are actually sketchy, partly because of poor government record keeping and then partly because of a lot of contributions were in services. And then of course, some were donated through provisions of equipment and trainings. So which could not be accounted for. So the organizations that um, some of these organizations, organizations they include um, World Bank, then the United States um, Agency for International Development, then WHO, UNICEF, and then of course, British Technical Assistance. So in a collaborative effort between the Nigerian government, USAID, the WHO, so a very successful program was actually launched against smallpox and measles in 1967 and then 1968. So where, where, where you have um, the USAID finance the cost of technical immunization expense, the Nigerian government and of course um, the WHO, they provided medical personnel and local cost. So this, this program was so successful in Lagos for instance, especially in 1968, where we have about 97% efficiency. And of course, this was an estimated, um, um, estimated success. So, and then of course, with more than 90% of the target population immunized. Of, so the success of this program against smallpox was so remarkable by the mid um, 1968. Sorry, you have four and, minutes more. Four minutes, I'm, I'm rounding up. So by the mid 1968, and then smallpox in, in uh, smallpox, uh, uh, smallpox incidents, by that time had dropped to about only two cases in a month in Western Nigeria. So then also they were also involved in um, oral rehydration therapy. And then of course, the expanded program on immunization by WHO and then of course by UNICEF. Then there were also several investigative projects, such as such as um, Guinea Worm Project in Anambra, in which um, the WHO and then later the Jimmy Carter Foundation had invested substantial, substantially. Then, then dur during the cholera epidemic in Nigeria between 1970 and 1971, WHO established cholera diagnosis and treatment centers throughout the country. So this. Um, this paper, one of the major um, initiatives provided by the international, international organization was actually to provide funding and then technical experts to help officials navigate the question of population control, nutrition, and then disease prevention. So this paper actually hopes to make three interventions. One is that international organizations were critical patterns, partners in supporting and expanding national health care policies and that they played an important role in disseminating international medical standards in Nigeria. Then secondly, the study um, shows more continuity in the colonial health care infrastructure than the independent regimes may care to acknowledge. And this supports um, Frederick, Cooper, Frederick Cooper's um, observation that post-colonial Africa shared many administrative and bureaucratic um, futures with colonial Africa. And then lastly, the study also demonstrates how Nigeria embarked on upon difficult state building projects between the 1960s and the 1980s and health initiatives were achieved among this because they were frequently equated with um, modern statecraft by Africans and then international organization representatives. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you, thank you very much, um, um, Dr. Cass, for your you know wonderful presentation. Um, I think one of the you know one of my you know um, you know intention you know for the panel is to you know um, have that um, you know engagement um, right between the colonial period to the post-colonial period, and <clears throat> because a lot you know not much has been done on 
on um, you know post-colonial um, history of health in Nigeria. And then apart so, so I think it's it's in two phases, right? The one is that there's just you know the colonial that um, I I I I know that there's still much to be done about colonial medicine, right? Um, but okay. especially because you know we have also basically just regionalized it. You know, um, we don't have this. Um, um, no, not much work can be said to have been done on East of Health in Nigeria, right? Um, we only have, um, you know, Southwest Nigeria, East of Health in Southwest Nigeria. You know, we have, um, you know, in Eastern Nigeria, we have, in, you know, um, and so, so, I think conversations like this, um, apart from allowing us to cross the, um, you know, colonial, you know, boundary, can give like a, you know, really holistic, you know, view of how, um, um, you know health systems was actually developed um, and i know that as you continue with um with the research you become more critical right of the activities of this international organization you know, apart from just um you know um, narrating their activities and you know, look at um mm -hmm. uh, be more critical you know, basically of it uh, but well we'll examine that more uh, when the questions arises um and so yeah thank you for that and then, so um patrick um Mr. Patrick Chukudike Opaleke is going to be talking to us on to die, quote, to die not from hanging, but from disease, um, end quote. Disease outbreaks and epidemics in colonial Nigerian prisons, um, 1872 to 1959. Um, Mr. Patrick is from University of View and he holds um, a BA, um, you know, his bachelor's in history and national studies. And um, an MA in social and political history, both from you know um, the same university. He has a keen interest on in the social history of Ibu land, Nigeria, and um, the West African region. He's presently gathering archival documents for which he intends to use in the reconstruction of his doctoral thesis um, that promises to sit at the intersection of both British colonial public health care in the um, 20th century. Um, we have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Ayo. And, um... It's great to have you here. So today I'll be talking about a section of uh, the British colonial healthcare system and social history of medicine as it relates to the dynamics of um, confinement in colonial Nigeria. Actually, you see, um, I grew up in an area in Lagos that has been classified as one of the most notorious slums. That is Ajegule. And <laughs> Yeah, I have to say this because sometimes as writers, we are inspired by our track records, our you know, antecedents. So unfortunately, I witnessed some persons who actually indulge in one crime or the other, and they were incarcerated for some time. By the time they come out, it seems they are not normal. Probably they are going through some form of mental health challenges or physiological health challenges or what have you. Um, I couldn't make sense of this, but I think the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic actually reinforces that thinking. Like, what is it with the Nigerian justice system, particularly with regards to prisons? Like, I know, of course, even those of us who are not behind or confined to a particular region, like prisons, we still struggle to enjoy good health. There's more or less shaky healthcare system in Nigeria. So how much more those who probably their rights, you know, their rights have been restricted based on some form of criminal justice system slammed on them. So during that time in New York in 2020, I saw the Black Maria moving some prisoners. So we were looking very machetated and not looking so good. So I began to think, wow, it appears probably we've not paid more attention to this set of hum humans who ordinarily going to prison should have served as a way of you know, rehabilitation for them so that when they get back to society, they become even better persons. Well, I was doing my research in the archives when I began to come across certain documents. So I saw something which said to die not from hanging, but from diseases. It struck my interest, you see, and I pushed for that. Generally, my paper is still ongoing. It is a research in progress, but I've gone for and I expect that the feedback can point me towards the right direction. So um, a group of Ekumeku fighters who were arrested by the British colonial government were you know, imprisoned in Calabar and penitentiary. Unfortunately, when the division officer 
was writing to the resident, he mentioned that out of the 150 untried persons designated as Ikumeku members, they all eventually died in prison from contracting different diseases. Secondly, I saw that two prisoners died out of small post contagion and it has spread to the barracks. So it simply tells us that even while these guys were confined or while they were you know, incarcerated into prisons, they were not altogether immune to the many form of diseases, illnesses that ravage colonial Nigeria. But then my point is this, a lot of scholars have actually explored some sections of colonial public health care, the social history of medicine or medical history generally. And on the other hand, I think not much attention has been given to see what public health care system or the approach to awareness is or was like in colonial Nigeria. So what did I do? I started to solve the net, Google Scholar, check up some articles to see what is British colonial prison system like? What is the criminal justice system doing colonial Nigeria was like? Well, to call the long story short, there's a whole lot of work that has been done in that area, right? But then I hardly found any of this work that have created a nexus between public health care and criminal justice system. Now, that is my intervention. I'm trying to see how I can draw a link, okay, to show how social history of medicine or colonial public health care system expanded even into Nigerian colonial prison system. But then we must not forget that during that period, like Lord Luga said in his book, the dual mandate, everything the British colonial government did was to favor the people and also to favor the colonial government, right? So in as much as they had a prison, it's not as if that was the first time Africans were being subjected or running a prison. The Songa Empire, they had prison during Mansa Musa period. In most stateless or as a fellow societies, they equally have their own indigenous criminal justice system, where probably most of their laws were classified into two, divine laws, man-made laws. So depending on what kind of crime you committed, you actually have to face a sort of panel and then a punishment served out to you. But that is not really my interest. My interest now is simply while I was exploring the literatures, right, on colonial prison, I observed that two key things categorizes or characterize the colonial prisons. And these are one, to bring about social order, right, by way of arresting people who gave colonial governments some tough time. On the other hand, we talk about the what we call the convict labor, convict labor. Majority of the works that were done by way of construction of roads, buildings, and what have you, most of those labors were gotten from those who were already in prison. And that was a typical in colonial Nigeria. You hear the cases of you have been sentenced to three months either to pay an exorbitant fine or probably you do some kind of service time with hard labor. That hard labor probably means you're going to engage in some sort of construction for the colonial government without being paid as a result of the first labor ordinance that was signed in 1917. But then why I kept pushing, I saw that, well, okay, this whole thing was like, you know, the issues everywhere around Africa. If I tested my research, even as far as um, colonial Indian, to, to see what the global literature is all about on prison, and it kept coming up. But then while I started to go through my cover sources, I saw that across Southern Nigeria, there are a whole lot of cases where rather than die through hanging, or probably rather than save terms based on what the colonial you know, government have sentenced you to do, probably most prisoners die as a result of the outbreak of diseases and epidemics. There are a whole lot of instances, but let me just cite, let me just cite probably one in Bamanda. Bamanda was like a province or a division under the then Eastern region in Southern Cameroon. And also we had similar cases like when the dysentery epidemic broke out in 1938 in Eastern Nigeria. We have issues that dealt with um, yellow fever. There are a whole lot of issues where prisoners died as a result of contagion from yellow fever and poor health care system. But I'm very much interested to see what we had the colonial response. Remember that the whole idea of prison is about social order and convict labor. So the British knew very well that if prisoners continue to die, it simply means that there won't be so much labor for them, you know, so much people to use in terms of colonial ventures to push that economic benefit. So they had to find a way to intercept frequent death of inmates. And then I discovered that through archival sources, some measures were taken. 
Now remember the first prison in colonial Nigeria was built in 1872 in the Lagos colony, right? And thereafter prisons were replicated everywhere in as much as the British government influence could be felt like close to native court administration and every other place where they have even the um, quarters, that's the quarters, you know, for the Europeans. They were police stations, they were kind of small cells and the rest of them that sounds like prisons. So, but the British government couldn't afford to lose more persons in prison because they know definitely that if people kept dying, it will affect their economic interest. So what did they do? They had to revise the ordinances on prisons and they revised one in 1916 and 1917. Basically, the revised ordinances spelled out a whole lot of things concerning rights to inmates, what needs to be done, what needs not to be done. Also, the British colonial government responded to epidemics, to disease outbreaks in prison by way of extending the medical and sanitary service department. But I quoted it here, I called it the sanitary inspectorate. They expanded a particular department to ensure that from time to time, certain appointed or designated sanitary officers visit some of these prisons to ensure that the kind of reports they, they got before were no longer there. What was this report? Most of the prisons building were in bad shape, for God's sake, overcrowding. In front of my document, I saw that women, men, and children were kept together. A prison that was designed by the PWD, that's the, Depart the Department for Public Works that was designed for 300 prisoners, has about 1,282 prisoners. And I also observed that there was also the policies of vaccination. This was one critical issue where the government had to bring out from different forms of campaigns to educate people about vaccination. Mm -hmm. Because of course, they were in a society where people had a traditional form of medicine and you come in to give them vaccines, you're like, you were trying to give them something that could be harmful. So they also extended vaccination to the prisons to make sure that whenever there's an outbreak of disease, people will be vaccinated. And then also there was this, for the architectural historian, there was this PWD arrangement to always design prisons in a way that will have good latrines. And also the issue of nice soil, those people who actually take out feces every night will stop. There'll be a proper channel for saga latrines and what have you. Those are some of the things I've discovered through the archival documents, even though I've not taken time to analyze the narratives in a proper form. And um, finally, I think my argument is simple. For me, history serves as a pointer, is a, is a teacher. It always have a lesson for the contemporary time to take from. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to argue that even in British colonial Nigeria, where we felt the government exploited people, the government was out to you know use people, their criminal justice system even have some form of better treatment for inmates. The fact that you have been confined to prisons, you have been confined behind the wall, is not enough reason for you to die. And they took it very seriously. Unfortunately, what we have today in Nigeria is, in fact, a quagmire. Thank you very much. I mean, thank you. Thank you very much for you know, for your presentation. I, one of the things that I liked about, um, you know, this presentation is it's basically how, you know, we sort of, it's sort of like a funnel, right? You know, we have this broad, uh, you know, view of, um, of someone who analyzed like the Nigerian health. Sorry, network, we, we couldn't get what you said most of the time. Ayo, can you hear me? How about now? Yes, it's better Yes, I now. can hear you. Yeah, it's better now. We can oh, hear okay. you. Yeah. yeah, these are the challenges. <laughs> it, it's okay. um, so I was just, <laughs> yeah, I was just talking about how I really liked um, how 
you know, the um, the presentations is just like a funnel, right? You know, um, from the international, you know, we have you know, the Nigeria, and then um, we have like uh, a space that um, many don't really, um, you know, consider uh, to to look at. You know, when you know we are talking about like um, uh, um, whether it's efficiency, right, of, or effectiveness of of our health system, and then you know, so I really liked um, you know that presentation. But um, we are supposed to have, um, you know, one more, um, you know, presenter, or uh, two more, you know, they're supposed to um, present on medicinal herb um, traders in, in Southwest Nigeria, but we don't have them here. So I guess we have enough time, you know, to engage, um, you know, to engage the audience, but also ask, you know, each other questions. Um, so there are two ways, right, that we can ask questions. We, we can either um, raise our hands, if you are, um, you know, from, you know, the audience can raise their hands and then I can call on them, but they can also type their questions on the Q&A platform, you know, that is available on Zoom. And um, I think our presenters can also ask each, each other um, questions. We keep losing, um, is, is that um, um, Aditula? Sorry, that's Bolani that we keep listening. Um, and then so, but I, I can start with um, with my um, question before you know the audience um, comes back, and I want to start um, with with Patrick. Um, I, yeah, I was I was just wondering mm -hmm. if. Um, I, I couldn't get a sense of the the region that you're specific, you know, about, or if your um, research is basically, um, you know, examining um, the prison, the British prison system writ large. I mean, it's good that you are able to make, you know, um, a sort of comparison and all that, but um, even from the topic, it's hard to tell, right, um, specifically which region. Now, you started with, um, Talking about the Ekumeku fighters, you know, I you don't know what Ekumeku fighters, you know, you know, uh, means. Um, but um, I think one of the things that might um, help is to, you know, to have this um, um, specific geography, right? You know, that's your. Um, I don't know if you, you know, you have one. I mean, I guess that's that's my question. You know. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ayo. I hope you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, originally, I was looking at, you know, making my geographical scope, right? Which is very important for historical study to so just be within the old Eastern region. But then I thought I could actually expand it to cover the entire Southern protectorate, right? Probably maybe as the work continues, I could actually still take it up to the North. Definitely for now, I've not been able to delimit the work, but I think it's very important I do so. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to take the entire, you know, the entire floor. Um, if you also have, you know, questions you want to ask, you know, to, you know, other presenters, please, um, you know, please go ahead. Um, I don't want to abuse, you know, my position here. <laughs> And then, so you know, if anyone is not asking, you know, asking any question, I have another question for um, the cast. Um, so I, I think it's. I mean, I find you, you know, the project really important because I'm also, um, you know, stepping out of, you know, you know um, examining um, colonial. My MA thesis, for example, you know, examined, you know, um, the historical epidemiology of yellow fever in in. Um, Colonial Nigeria, um, but for my dissertation, you know, I'm also stepping out of uh, you know, that's colonial boundary, um, and I was just wondering because you're you know really interested in you know um, looking at um, you know the role that an international organizations play. I like how you know you started by analyzing how Nigeria inherited um, you know its healthcare um, system from you know the colonial period, right? Um, but I was wondering if 
you know, the specific, I don't know um, if they are, what methodology are you using, right? And what um, sources are you examining? Um, are you accepting, you know, um, what is coming from, you know, the sources of line and sink? Um, to what extent do you think all the figures, right, you know, that you are getting about like uh, the contributions of international organizations to, to the Nigerian health system, what those figures, um, to what extent are you able to critique them? Um, cause you might, um, I, 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 um, I fear you might fall into like um, this, you know, sort of top down, you know, history, right? Um, and then I don't know if I maybe, you know, lost, um, you know, the, the arguments there, but you can, you know, sort of try to restate, you know, the arguments. Um, but also, how are you critiquing, right, the, the sources that you are using? Does that, does that make sense? Can you hear me now? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Yes, I got the first question, but we, we couldn't hear you by the time you were talking about the second question. Sorry, so I, which one did you get? Which question did you get? I got the first question about methodology, but the second yes, question- the, the second question- I got a question you know, about is, the sources, the methodology, am I using? Yeah. Yes, the second question is basically still about how you are critiquing you know, your sources, right? Because okay. uh, you know, maybe it's me, I, it seems to be, because I know that not um, all, one of the, you know, the uh, job that a historian does is to say, okay, we look at the sources, but, are they as is this source telling us the truth? You know, how are you analyzing you know those sources for because it seems like um you know sort of you know giving us oh this is what they did, you know, this is what they say that they did, you know. How are you you know engaging you know those 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 sources? Um, you know, um does that okay. make sense? Uh, of course, yes. So uh, all right, so thank you for your question. Actually, the plan is. So, okay, just like I said at the opening of my, um, my talk, that is actually something I stumbled upon in the course of um, getting, gathering data for my PhD research. And of course, in the, in the case of um, this paper, the, the plan is actually to look into um, um, both primary and secondary sources data and then for the primary sources primarily using newspapers from the archives and then of course just like you said it is not accepting the narratives of outline and sinker just like we have it it will be it will be sub subjected to analysis and then of course secondary sources we have secondary sources already and then from primary data it will also help to give insight into what others have said. And then, of course, subject it to analysis. Yeah. I hope I've answered your question. Um, yes, yes. I mean, I, I can understand that, you know, we are all at um, different stages of our, of our research. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't need to have, uh, you know, something that is, um, you know, completely, um, I mean, Something that is complete, you know, in in in, in um in terms of um, um the analysis, in terms of you know structure and all that. Um, but I, I guess it's just something um for you to also think about. Um, oh sure. And then okay, and then so do you guys also um have um you know, questions for each other? I think we lost our Belanley again, but um. Hello, I, I don't want to do all the talking here. Okay, yeah, I, I understand. Okay, she's back. I think the network has been very funny, coupled with the fact that um, the rain is affecting yeah. it. I thought you said you wanted to ask a question. Otherwise, I okay. can, okay. 
not at all. Go ahead. Yeah. So one of the things that I that I'm also looking at is how um, I mean different um, you know fields that we have here. You know, um, the, and as a result of the fact that you know, we have a historian, we have someone doing international studies, and we have um, someone in, in philosophy. We have different approaches. You know, right? And then if we have not been in a more disciplinary gathering before, it will sometimes be hard to, to sort of, um, you know, um, understand where, you know, others are coming from. But of course, uh, um, one of the things um, that we have to do is to, um, you know, uh, make sure that um, we see from different angles, different lenses. You know. uh, for example, when Patrick started, you know, he started, uh, I think, like um, a historian would, you know, um, you know, um, sort of um, start um, research. Um, but um, I haven't been in different, because I, I think ultimately the kind of history, uh, medical history that um, even historians have to, have to do is to be able to, to have that openness, right? And not just to do history for history's sake, you know, to just, um, you know, say, oh, I just want to understand this period for the sake of it, right? And that's why I like um, the idea that, um, you know, um, Patrick is say, you know, talking about how we can use that to look at, you know, the present, uh, you know, prison system, you know, right? You know, to, um, um, is a specific study. I think that, um, I know, you know, maybe historians don't necessarily um, look at, Theories, but when you when you started your presentation, it made me you know think about like you know states of you know, exception, um, you know um, that um, I think you know historians have used a lot. I, I feel like it can help you, um, you know, um, sort of. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the historian that is, um, but um, states of exception includes the time of um, you know outbreaks, for example. It includes um, people that are, you know, trying to um, immigrants. You know, for example, it it looks at how those states, you know, those people in certain you know spaces where there isn't the full, um, they don't have like um, you know, the rights you know that normal humans would write and uh, would have on a normal day. You know, to, to, um, how do we treat these people? How does the, you know, government, um, you know, treat these people? Whether, you know, your immigrants that are trying to cross the ocean, you know, there's a particular way in which we can, you know, try to understand, you know, this set of people, you know, um, that is sort of different from when it's just, when everything is just normal. I think, you know, there are theories that can help really understand, you know, that can help really um, you know, understand that. I know, was it Peter Redfield that, um, studied um, um, the, the MSF, the medical um, um, Sound Frontier, um, um, Doctors Without Borders, you know, their, their activities during the yeah. Biafran Civil War. That's a state of, you know, the war is also a state of exception, right? You know, to yeah. understand, um, you know, specific, um, you know, um, category of people in certain spaces, right? You know, I think it's something that I'm really fascinated about, you know, and just, like a sort of comments, you know, something that can guide, um, you know, that research, um, you know, going forward. Since, Thank you. Yeah. So I think I just want to, it's not like a question, probably, just I need some clarification from Docas. Yeah, that mean, I think um, the title of our work is very interesting, strengthening, you know, nationhood. I think that's what she said. Um, um, it has to do with the role of international organizations actually assisting Nigerian health initiative in post independent Nigeria, right? So I'm just wondering because uh, I know for every action, there is an equal opposite reaction. And for the issue of health, there is a sort of um, international politics or diplomacy associated with almost everything between nations. So like she mentioned the USAID and some others, I'm just curious to know probably if she was able to look inward to see if there was a kind of 
or is it if there is a kind of tick for tar like are there any kind of okay i'm going to do this for your country to help your health care because like you started the panel you said um, the issue of organ harvesting for god's sake come on if these guys are actually trying to strengthen our nation's health care and um i don't know how their own hospitals like india for instance make so much money from international health tourism right and if we have um, some kind of international body trying to strengthen our healthcare system. So I just can't place it, but I think she can probably dedicate either a subheading or probably one or two paragraphs to just help us understand the dynamics of international health policies. We want to strengthen our healthcare, but we still have um, billions of naira or dollars per se being expended on health tourism. I don't know if my question is clear, my, my uh, you know, Dummy. So can I just <laughs> one? <laughs> She's even here. I forgot. I thought she saw me. <laughs> so am I clear? Yes, you are. You are. Okay. Actually. Uh, okay. Yeah. So actually. The, the, Sorry. The, um. Okay. Dami, it, um, it's if you can quickly answer the question. We have um. Victor okay. Laoya and Nuri Nobundari um who are raising their uh, answer. Okay. Um, let me just, just let me just yeah. let me just quickly respond to that. Actually, the plan is, sorry, there's, a, there's an interference here. We're in the conference room here. So can you hear me now? Sorry. Okay, here, yeah, better. So actually, I, like I said earlier, it is actually an ongoing work. And of course I have an outline of what I plan to do. And this is just like, Sorry. And this is just like what um, Patrick uh, mentioned, the dynamics of international polit um, politics in healthcare. healthcare system in African countries, of course, Nigerian inclusive, is actually part of what I have outlined. And his, his question is like an affirmation to the fact that I'm on track in my outline. So I would definitely look into that. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, and we have um, Victor Lau, you ask your question. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? We can Hello? hear you, we can hear you. Okay, oh. Thank you all for this panel. I really enjoy myself, I've learned a lot. Uh, uh, my question is directed to uh, is it Dr. or Mrs. Fakite, Um, I want to know your appraisal about uh, the place of Nigeria in international health system. And um, on your work, where do you intend to get uh, data? And um, that's one of my uh, major challenges on on uh, medical, on topics that are related to uh, international health systems. Where do you need to get your data? Or um, besides, do you have a particular international health uh, organization in mind? That's all. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, please. I lost a part of the question, but I, if I get you, um, you know, clearly, you're saying where do you get the sources and, and the data yes. for, um, okay. Thank you. That okay. is for for okay. me. All yeah, right. Yeah. So thank you, um, Victor, for your question. So the idea is actually to um, go to ministries of health, especially state ministries of health. Then the plan is to um, select um, cities within um, the and the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria to visit their uh, ministry, the ministries of health to get their records right from independence till, till date. So that's the plan. And also, um, I also plan to look into um, the, um, the WHO's website. Of course, I have some documents already which I acquired about their involvement in. Um, in Nigeria. And then also I have some, I also have some documents that 
I got through the help of someone from the um, from the British archives. So all of this, I believe, will be useful, will be helpful in writing this paper. Okay. Have okay. I answered? Uh, no, uh, I, I want to make a suggestion. I think you can okay. uh, send an email to uh, the W to, uh, the WHO because of the COVID nineteen uh, challenges. So they they are already improvising that instead that you do need to visit WHO archive. So like in, in my own case, I had uh, I, I went to the uh, WHO office. So they asked for my topic and uh, and for my email address. So they had to compress all the related archival uh, documents mm. to my topic. So they sent them to me, although it was heavy. So I think you can you can try that as well. I can just send them an email. So. Thank you. Topic that are related to your topic, they can compress it and send it to you. Thank you so much, Victor. I will also mail you too. So we talk for that. I mean, yes, I, I know that he I know that he is working on um, I yeah. think Rockefeller Foundation. And then so I think it will be a very um <clears throat> good source. Um I've also emailed the you know the WH I was going to mention that. So that is one way that you could. Hello, can anyone hear us? Hello, yeah, it's gone off. I can hear you for sure. Okay, okay sir. Oh, yes, like the network is also dealing with you. Oh my gosh, yeah, it's dealing seriously with me. <laughs> Hello? Hello, so yeah, <laughs> thank you. And so, I think we have um, new reading now. We have um, Nuruddin from, go Hello. ahead, please. Okay, oh, uh, I'm sorry. I caught uh, the presentation very late in the process because I just joined. I'm sorry, I'm just coming back from work. So it's been a hell of a day. Uh, I caught the last part about your presentation about uh, the politics of vaccination and also how people are actually being, uh, being vaccinated against the disease in the Eastern prison or in the Nigerian British colonial prison. So my question is actually this, you know, uh, how do you think the, for instance, because this is a very a topic I actually have an interest in because I myself, I'm working on the vaccination in Southwestern Nigeria, not Eastern part of Nigeria. So my question is, how do you think the uh, Eastern elite actually reacted to this process? Do they actually like encourage people for the vaccination, especially when uh, the British went on this, you know, this particular campaign on it? Because it's kind of like different from the Yoruba, if I can explain from the context of Southwestern Nigeria. It is a process that actually, you know, developed gradually, especially from the early stage of colonial period down to uh, the 1940s, when voices started to change about why people should actually receive vaccination, especially when Christianity and also Islam have, have taken center stage and education have become you know, the go-to norms for people. So uh, they actually like try to like encourage people. They become like the voice of the colonial people. So I understand that part of the Southwestern Nigeria, but for the Eastern part of, uh, and you present a very neat topic, especially Nigerian politics, which is actually very interesting because I was actually looking forward to listening to that. So uh, I guess that's just my question. I, I mean, how did the Eastern elite actually react to all this stuff, you know? Because of course the elite, they were also part of the old guard, the people who believe in the traditional system, then the coming of Europe and actually change the narrative about, you know, how things could be, how do we react to, how do we react to Western medicine then? So 
is that's my question. Yeah, can I go ahead? Uh, yes, yes, please. I was just going to I was just going to add that. Why right. is it just why is Nuru just mentioning elites? You know, what what about you know, uh, you know, um, I guess normal people since yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually mentioning the elites because you know when you look at COVID nineteen and when you look at disease outbreak generally, uh, when you talk about the elites, you are talking about the political authority. You are talking about the Christian or religious authority. You are talking about people who actually. You know, people who can actually influence the shepherds, people who can actually influence people that follow them. So these people, their voices actually carries with people listening to them, especially like, you know, when you look at COVID outbreak, uh, most people in Nigeria uh, are actually against, you know, receiving the vaccine. When you discuss with most people, even the educated people about, because they don't know what is actually in the vaccine itself. And these are people that actually echoed what they listen from other people, especially what pastors preach from the pulpits and what imams tell them in the mosque. So these people are, also, are critical in how a system actually work in Nigeria, especially in a country whereby traditional system play critical role in how we actually think or in how we actually react to illness. Because the idea of self itself is something that is actually escapulated in culture. So they play important role in all this. So that's why I'm actually like actually interested in that particular part of this thing because. All right, can, are you, can I can I take it up? I think not. Okay, I think um, Nurudin, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. All right, I think our chair is having um, a bit of an issues with his network, and we don't have much time. So I, I think I might be right to answer even though he's not with us. Or probably I should just wait a minute. Um, let's just see if we'll come back online. If it doesn't, then I'll take it up. Uh, let's wait a moment. Okay, I think it's taking too much time. So, no reading. Really Hello. Yeah, I can hear you, sir. All right, thank you very much. I really appreciate that question. Indeed, it is a very insightful um question so concerning the issue of how or what roles the the elites in eastern region during colonial rule played in terms of the policies of vaccination now you know i'll answer that question in two ways from or from two fronts the first front is i'll answer it in a general way in a general term and the other one is i will answer it based on the paper i just presented now there were a whole lot of issues when it comes to vaccination. In fact, believe me when I said it was even tougher for the British colonial government in southeastern Nigeria. And why is that so? Unlike in the southwest, where predominantly the ethnic group was Yoruba, in the old eastern region, we had multiferous ethnic groups from the Igbo, the Bibio, the Efik, the Anang, the Oron, the Eket. We even had up to the Cameroon region, Bamanda and what have you. Now, this is a combination of different cultural, you know, fronts coming against British colonial public health care system. It was very difficult for them. There were cases where people refused to get vaccinated. And in most cases, the chiefs, those who were in places of authority, power, could not even convince the people. I'll be presenting another paper that has to do with this central epidemic in our Chuku area. You will see here, I was able to illustrate a genderized form of resistance. We had this time around, the women damned the men and took the resistance because they no longer trusted their Waran chiefs. They no longer trusted those mm. who were in authority of power. They felt that these people have been bribed. They have collected some form of you know, gratification from the colonial government. So they resisted. In Southeastern Nigeria, it was complicit. It was so large. In fact, we had one particular case in Ogoni Division where a sanitary officer reported that the Apostolic Church members, they thought that vaccination was more or less a kind of um, substance that the British government wanted to use in decimating them, you know, reducing their population. But at the end of the day, the long and short story is there were conflicts, resistance in the issue of vaccination. Now, the second approach is this, within the context of my paper, which has to do with prison, 
we must realize that this particular image, they have been confined. They have lost certain rights. They have lost certain choices, either to accept or not to accept. And because they are in close quarters, they needed to survive. I've not really gotten there. Like I said, my work is in pro progress. I'm still, you know, sorting mm -hmm. and trying to, you know, decipher the analysis from the correspondences by the British colonial administrators. And I suppose, by way of normal thinking, that even though they could actually have resisted, they could not because they were already inside a confined world. And the only option they had was to follow strictly the measures spelled out by the British colonial government to save their life so that they can continue to serve as that convict labor needed by the colonial government. I don't know if I'm clear on that. Yeah, yeah, you actually made yes. a very, made good, a very good point it. right One there. In the other, in the, uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, I guess another question I would like to ask, and, um, and which you've actually like answered, even, even the process of your presentation itself is right. like, uh, <laughs> How will all go work? Welcome, sir. <laughs> Welcome. How are you? Thank you. It's it's a mess over here. The network. I'm sorry, sorry about that. that. So I'm yeah. able to answer no so, this question actually, but I wanted to bring up something else. Sorry, yeah. sorry. What was uh, your response? This... Just briefly. Okay, I'm I sorry, answer the question. I answer the question from two <laughs> perspectives. One, I tried okay. to give him a reply that generally the issue of vaccination was, in fact, a big headache to the colonial government in southeastern Nigeria, much more than even in western Nigeria. And the reason is simple. I told him that the multiplicity of ethnic groups meant there were various or a plethora of perspective to indigenous health, disease, and awareness. You have the Ogoni people, you have the Anang, the Eket, the Igbo, the Bibios, and what have you in the old eastern region, up to Cameroon region. So it was quite healthy. But in the case of the prison, they actually had little or no choice because already they were confined. They were more or less like the colonial government's property, so to speak, right? And they, even when they wanted to reject vaccination, like others outside did, ran away and created a lot of problem. They could not because they were already in a choked environment where they had no other choice than to be vaccinated. So I pleaded with him to join the next section where I'll be discussing a genderized form of resistance put up by women resisting sanitary measures, resisting colonial health policies in a very strong way. And it's going to be an interesting piece. Thank you. Thank you for that. Because we have yeah. just three more minutes, I would allow um, Nurujin to continue his um, question, second question. Yeah, right. uh, I guess my other question is, I mean, you've answered them, like you made use of uh, my resources and all those kind of stuff. Yes. So uh, I guess my other question is, uh, what specific sources are you, like what particularly are you engaging in? And uh, what specific source are you engaging with? All right, let me take that quickly. So if you look at from my, my time frame, my work has three scopes, thematic, geographical, and um, I also have that of the chronology, right? Now, the time frame is simply 1872 to 1959. Basically, it tells you that it's um, a bit of pre-colonial, or colonial rather, starting from Lagos Colony, when the first prison was built in Lagos, designed to contain 300 inmates, but over time it became overcrowded and started to cause problems. And the kind of sources I indulge or engaged in is purely colonial archival documents, correspondences between divisional officers, district officers, resident officers, and the Secretary of State, right? And then I equally do not just want to make my work too historical, I needed to engage an ongoing debate by way of global literature. So I was able to look up some of the existing literature published in various art and journals to see what the argument had been on colonial prison and also on healthcare, like I said earlier. So I was able to find a way to create a nexus between public healthcare and colonial prisons, not just only in Southern Nigeria or Nigeria, but I was able to push it further to incorporate Africa and even as far as Indian. Do you try to like, um, oh, sorry, sorry for that yeah. again. Like, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, ahead. Do, you, do you try to like look at the uh, connection for the overcrowded of, because of course, like in most colonial state or in most colonial city states, eventually yes. like urbanization was actually a cause for, you know, uh, migration for people 
And uh, because of like uh, the injustice in these urban cities, most people were actually, you know, crime skyrocketed. And we do you try to like look at that connection between, you know, that particular, you know, uh, uh, labor a form of like a labor form of history, form of like you know, using economic history to try to like postulate a point why prisons actually overcrowded and why people are actually in the urban center rather than the rural area. Okay. Um, so very quickly, all right. Okay, so this is, I, I'd like, I'd really like for us to stop right on time, but okay. that's a very important question, Rudin. And you, of course, know that we have a, a part two, right, of this section. And so it's, I think it's a good way to try and draw you to, the, to our next session, uh, which is um, by 5.30. So, uh, of course, Rudin is actually presenting there. So, Patrick, All right. you are invited oh. to, to come later. So I, I'm having a section. I'm also having a section by that same time. Oh. That's the problem. Brilliant. So, we can just, um, <laughs> we can just you know, postpone this. this I think I'll engagement. connect. Just I'll so find a way to come. connect with Rudin. I'll connect with him. Of course, of course. I just so like he don't get us out of this All right. Thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you all very thank much. Thank you, Ayo. It's a pleasure seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.